Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here for the fourth time for these debates, which seem to go so very well. There's no reason why tonight should be any exception. Um, the motion to be debated is, in 2017, cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for writers. I say it again. In 2017, cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for writers. After this debate, there'll be a vote, and I'll introduce you to our three speakers, uh, and we'll come to here to make the speeches. Afterwards, we'll sit there and take as many questions as we can fit in, which will be quite a lot. On my far left is James Young, who will propose the motion. Can you all hear me? James Young will propose the motion. He is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Victoria. His work in philosophy of language focuses on theories of truth, and on the debate between realists and anti-realists. He's particularly interested in the philosophy of music and art as a source of knowledge, and his several books include Cultural Appropriation and the Arts. Sarah Churchill, on my immediate left, will oppose the motion. She's the professorial fellow in American Literature and Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Her books include The Many Lives of Marilyn Monroe, a literary journalism has appeared in The Guardian, The New Statesman, The TLS, The New York Times Book Review, and she's appeared on Question Time and Newsnight. Her new book, Behold America, A Partial History of America First and the American Dream, will be published next May. Next to her is Bonnie Greer, who will act, who will act as a commentator, crossbench if you like, in the debate. She was born on the south side of Chicago, but she's lived over here for 30 years. She's an award-winning playwright, novelist and critic. Her last play, The Hotel Cerise, which predicted the election of Donald Trump, opened last year at the Theatre Royal Stratford East. She's also a columnist on the pro-Remain paper, The New European. I first call, therefore, on James Young to propose the motion. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose the motion that in 2017, cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for, uh, for writers. I'll begin by just explaining what I take appropriation to be. And this is simply the Oxford English Dictionary definition. To appropriate is to take as one's own or as one's own to use something. And cultural appropriation occurs, particularly in this case, in the case of writing, when someone takes something that has been produced in another culture, in a culture to which the author does not belong. Now, what is appropriated? Two sorts of items have been particularly controversial. The first sort of item is the appropriation of a story that has been told in another culture. Sometimes this can be a myth or traditional story uh, that is characteristic of a, of a culture other than the one to which a writer belongs. The second controversial sort of thing that is appropriated is the subject matter of a culture, the culture itself taken as the object appropriated. I'll give you a couple of examples of each sort of appropriation. So the first sort of appropriation, where a story is appropriated, uh, a good example of this is Robert Bringhurst. He is a white Canadian poet who has translated into English the myths of the Haida Nation, the Haida Nation being a West Coast First Nation. Um, you may know uh, it as the Queen Charlotte Islands. We now know it as Haida Gwaii. Another sort of appropriation occurs when the subject matter of a culture is appropriated. And here are a couple of examples. Peter Hobbs, In the Orchard, The Swallows. Here we have an English writer appropriating uh, Pakistani culture as his subject matter. And an older example is Kim by Rudyard Kipling, where he appropriates the subject matter of Indian culture. There's a special case of cultural appropriation that has been particularly controversial. It's sometimes called voice appropriation. And this occurs 
when someone appropriates the subject matter of another culture and tells a story about that culture uh, in the first person, presenting themselves as a member of that culture. And as I say, this is sometimes called <coughs> voice appropriation. Voice appropriation occurs in a variety of contexts in literature, but it can also occur in the context of uh, visual arts. Here's an example that's been uh, particularly controversial <coughs> earlier this year. So I'm sure many of you are aware of the story of Emmett Till. He was a young African-American teenager who was brutally murdered uh, as part of the civil rights movement in the United States. Earlier this year, a white American author, or painter rather, Dana Schultz, painted him in his coffin. The story you'll recall is that Emmett, Emmett Till had been so brutally beaten that his mother insisted that the coffin be opened at the funeral so that people could see what had been done to her 13-year-old son. Now, why is cultural appropriation wrong and why is it inappropriate in 2017? Well, there are two kinds of problems that can occur with cultural appropriation. For a start, cultural appropriation can cause a harm that violates a right. And secondly, cultural, cultural appropriation can be morally offensive by being, um, by being offensive in a particular kind of way, which I'll explain. Let's begin by considering harm that is caused by cultural appropriation. Often this harm takes the form of violation of property rights. The offense is a different kind of case because when somebody engages in cultural appropriation that violates our right, we can see that it is clearly wrong. But no one has a right not to be offended. Nevertheless, certain forms of cultural appropriation, because they are offensive, are morally wrong. Any kind of offense that is gratuitous, insensitive, ill-formed, Ill, uh, can cause offense that is morally objectionable. So I'll give you an example. Um, a bunch of alt-right alt -right goons holding a Columbus Day parade outside of a Indian reservation. This is an American example, obviously. So I, I, must, I must note that I am, in fact, Canadian. Uh, um, and there are no, well, we don't celebrate Columbus Day in Canada, I also want to point out. Um, no one's rights are violated by holding such a march. It wouldn't be illegal. And yet, we would all, I think, agree that this would be the kind of gratuitous and insensitive behavior would be immoral. There are two kinds of offense that actions can cause. Uh, there's common or garden variety offensiveness, and that would be the offensiveness of the unwashed man on the tube. But then there's profound offense, and this is the kind of offense that we're dealing with when we're dealing with cultural appropriation. Profound offense strikes at the core values of, a, of an individual or group, and we're going to see uh, that cultural appropriation can frequently do that. It can threaten uh, the very being of a group or a culture. Cultural appropriation does cause profound offense, and can do so both when the content of a myth or a story is appropriated, it can also do so when the subject matter of a culture is appropriated. In order to understand why this is the case, you need to know something that people in Britain, people in Europe generally, of course, must uh, distinguish a little more carefully than we used to, the British and the Europeans. Uh, what you don't realize, living as you do in this continent, you don't really have a clear idea of the sense of genuine and, leg uh, and deep sense of grievance that indigenous people feel. The raw, exposed nerves of a badly mistreated people. This applies particularly, I'm thinking now, of the indigenous people of America, of the Americas and Australasia. But it also applies to colonized peoples around the world as well. They have a legitimate grievance. Now, let's turn to the question of the, the theft of stories from these cultures. Theft 
of the sort that Robert Bringhurst engaged in when he retold the stories of the Haida people without asking their permission. What you need to realize is that in certain cultures, unlike Western culture, stories are the perpetual property of a culture, and frequently the perpetual property of a subcultural entity like a clan. In, in Western law, these stories are regarded as being in the public domain. But why should they be regarded as in the public domain? The traditional stories are not protected by copyright law they have, because they have no identifiable author. But why should the applicable laws be the laws of the imperialist settler cultures? Why shouldn't the applicable laws be the, cult, the, the laws of the cultures themselves? In their culture, these are property, and the property of a clan. And the Western cultural imperialists come along and say, I don't know, you know there's no identifiable author, so this is, now belongs to us. We can copyright it if we like. First they take the land, then they take the stories. There's another uh, form of theft. The, the, the stories of a culture are the culture's stories to tell. At very least, they deserve first crack at, at telling these stories. Otherwise, the outsiders are profiting illegitimately at the expense of the insiders. Here's a recent example. Um, Alicia Elliott, uh, she's a Tuscarora woman. Uh, this is a Canadian First Nation. Uh, as you can see, she quote, entered a short story contest with a piece about the complicated relationship between two indigenous women and lost to a story written by a white American man that not only appropriated outright, but misrepresented indigenous ceremonies. And this is a multiply offensive case because it's stealing the subject matter and misrepresenting <coughs> the ceremonies of the culture. The misrepresentation of a culture can be harmful, not merely as a form of theft, it can be uh, harmful as a kind of perpetuation of, of stereotypes. Think, for example, of old Hollywood movies in which uh, indigenous people are represented as mendacious and dim-witted and violent. This sort of misrepresentation can, as I say, perpetuate these harmful stereotypes and continue to do harm to future generations of indigenous people. Another way in which the appropriation can be wrong, as I've indicated, is by being offensive. Often the myths that are, are appropriated uh, have a ritual or spiritual significance. And to retell these myths without understanding them is akin to rewriting the Bible or the Koran in a way uh, that would be offensive to Christians or Muslims. We would all agree that that would be offensive in a profound way and wrong. Why don't we say the same thing about the indigenous case. It is profound case. This is profound offense. It strikes at the very heart of a culture and all that it holds dear. This is not limited to literature. Here's a case of Cameron Hayes, who's a white Australian. Uh, he has um, appropriated um, in this picture, as you can see, Tiwi funeral poles in a way that was deeply offensive uh, to the uh, uh, Tiwi people in Australia. And as I say, when the, when the outsiders represent themselves as being, uh, as being insiders, as appropriating their voice, this, is, this offense is redoubled. One of the things that's going on here is a, what we might call white splaining. It's, a, it's something akin to mansplaining. I'm sure you're all familiar with men explaining familiar things to women. White splaining is a similar sort of thing. Ar arguably, of course, I'm both white splaining and man splaining as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> but white splaining occurs when members of minority groups um, have their own culture condescendingly explained to them by white people. And this multiplies the, the, the offense. And of course, here are some really particularly offensive cases. Here we have going so far as to appropriate the skin. This is um, a costume that was produced by the uh, Disney Corporation based on a character from the recent movie Moana. I I'm pleased to say that even the Disney Corporation realized they'd gone too far, and this was withdrawn from sale. For sale. The sort of deluxe case of offensive of, of uh, 
cultural appropriation occurs in the form of gray owling. Gray owl, whose real name was Archibald Bellini, born in Hastings, posed as a Ojibwe and passed for Indian. And of course, nowadays we see many, many uh, people passing for Indian. This is deeply offensive to First Nations people. So that is why, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I suggest that it be resolved that in 2017, cultural appropriation is inappropriate for writers. is, should it be resolved, I'm of course putting it as a question, uh, should it be resolved that in 2017, cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for writers? Before answering that question, I would first like to wish everyone Happy Thanksgiving. It is, as you may know, today is in fact American Thanksgiving. And this is the day when traditionally we celebrate the arrival of European settlers to apparently feed the indigenous people. Wasn't that nice of us? Before we arrived, at least on the basis of this clearly 19th century image, uh, First Nations couldn't feed themselves their own food, but then the white people arrived and fixed everything for them, and after giving them turkey, our subsequent <coughs> gifts were land grabs, broken treaties, forced migrations, starvation, deracination, epidemic, addiction, and genocide. We celebrate these events every year by dressing small children up as savages and teaching them how kind and thankful the European settlers were to native populations. Happy Thanksgiving. I should say I'm appropriating all of these images off of the internet without the permission of the people in them, so I'm doing some appropriation right now. Um, so, you might think that I am making my opponent's case for him. Insensitive? Definitely. Offensive? I should say so. I would hope that these images are not just offensive to indigenous peoples and their descendants. I find, them, I find this one particularly offensive, which is why I chose it. As James rightly said, native rituals and dress are not vaudeville for privileged white people to have fun with. So, so far, so much in agreement with my opponent. So where does the debate part of the evening come in, you may be wondering. The question is, should it be resolved? Cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for writers. And I want to suggest that the problem is not with the question of cultural insensitivity, and I'll come back to this point, but with the proposition. My job is to argue <coughs> against the proposition. James began usefully by giving us the OED's definition of appropriation, and I've agreed this is indeed the meaning of appropriation. The problem comes, in my view, with the way that the proposition is framed. Here's where we start to get into trouble. First of all, James's examples were extremely specific. They were limited to First Nations, and then at the very end, some examples of uh, a mention of colonized peoples. But it, the proposition is not that we should not culturally appropriate the stories of First Nations, or that European settlers should not appropriate the story of First Nations, or indeed that people from colonized heritages should not, or post-colonial heritages should not appropriate the stories of the colonized. It is far, far broader than that. It is, the proposition is that writers should not engage in cultural appropriation, that it is inappropriate. The proposition is as broad as a broad thing in broad land. And my objection is going to be that there are three points here where I don't actually accept the, um, the, the proposition as it's put forward. Appropriation, we're agreed on. I'll return to the problem of writers 
at the end. But before then, what is a culture? That may sound like an obvious question, or as if the answer to it is obvious, but who decides? And what does it mean to belong to a culture? And again, who decides? Now, in the examples that James used, and indeed in the examples that I just used in my images, it's pretty easy to tell. These people do not belong to those cultures. They have no obvious relationship to those cultures. Okay, up to a point. But even with the example of Thanksgiving, after two centuries of traditions, and it's a tradition that is, where greed is a stupid and offensive tradition, but it is now a part of Anglo-European American culture. Native dress is not European culture, no. But Thanksgiving is the culture of the United States, like it or not. And my point is that culture is not clean. It's not demarcated. It's increasingly hybrid in an increasingly hybrid world. Bonnie Greer and I both come from Hyde Park, Chicago, and I wanted to have a little shout out to Obama. So I don't know if you can see that, but it says Happy Birthday, President Obama, and that's from one of his neighbors in um, Hyde Park, Chicago, which is the south side of Chicago. Bonnie and I both belong to Chicago culture. We belong to Chicago culture. We both grew up there. Our families have both been there for more than one generation, which in America is a pretty long time. But how long do you have to live in a culture for it to be your culture? Bonnie has lived here for 30 years and has a British passport. I've lived here for almost 20 years and have a British passport. Am I British? No. But I have lived in Britain almost as long as I lived in Chicago. I left Chicago 30 years ago. Do I still really belong to Chicago? Would the people who live in Chicago agree that I belong to Chicago? If I don't even know what the new restaurants are, if I don't know what the music scene is, if I don't know what the art scene is, can I really say that I belong to Chicago culture? But I come from five generations of people who've lived in Chicago. I would take it very ill if somebody said to me that I am not from Chicago and that Chicago isn't my culture. And yet in very real senses, you could make the argument that it is not. Is growing up in it enough? Is two generations, three generations? When does it become your culture? My family lived on the south side of Chicago in <coughs> Hyde Park at the turn of the 20th century and through the first decades of the 20th century. They left in the 1950s when families like Bonnie's started to move in. My grandparents were part of the racist reaction that is known as white flight. They moved to the suburbs where I grew up. But Bonnie was taken by bus to the high school where I studied. Does she belong to suburban white culture? Do I belong to a south side of Chicago that is now primarily, but by no means solely, populated by African Americans? <coughs> the blues, great Chicago musical tradition, African American music, which comes from slave spirituals. But slave spirituals are adapted from the Protestant hymns that the European settlers brought from, in fact, mostly Britain. Swing low, sweet chariot. It's, a British, uh, it's an American slave spiritual, but good luck telling British rugby fans that that song is not part of their culture. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is strange, but it is part of their culture. To us, it's strange. And that's my point. First problem, who decides who belongs to which culture as soon as borders have been crossed in a post-border, post-hybrid, post-colonial, post-migration, post-imperialist, post-crossbred culture. Do you have to be genetically mixed race for it to be okay? Well, I'm personally very uncomfortable with that idea because that I would view as biological determinism. But I cannot see that cultural determinism is a better solution. So my point here is not that I disagree with the problem of cultural insensitivity. I disagree with this proposition as the remedy. I also got this off of the internet. I think it's fabulous. I'm sorry that you probably can't see it very well. It's, uh, it's an algorithm of rock and roll. And on the left, we have country, blues, jazz. Then we have folk, rockabilly, R&B, uh, doo-wop, Brit invasion, soul, funk, folk rock, all the way over to new wave, heavy metal, grunge, punk. Uh, and at the bottom, dri driving out of that, is rap, hip hop, etc. So I'm sorry that you can't see that. Um, 
rock and roll. Black musicians adapted it from the blues and boogie woogie that was adapted from a fusion of African Caribbean rhythms and European Protestant hymns. And then white musicians appropriated it. Elvis Presley appropriated it. The Beatles appropriated it. And it came back again. And again, I would say, good luck telling people in Liverpool that rock and roll is not part of their culture. It's not just a question of how we establish ownership, which I'm suggesting we cannot do as soon as anyone crosses a border and lives somewhere else, or at least we can't do it in a simple way. As soon as internal migration happens, much less external migration. This does not have to be a question of colonization. This can be a question of moving cities. It's also a question of whether we would prefer to be without this mingled hybrid culture. I mean, okay, some of us might think the world would be a better place if heavy metal had never happened. <laughs> and I'm prepared to accept that. And that would be a different proposition. I would agree with that um, proposition. But I'm not prepared to get rid of the Brit invasion. Notice the word invasion in this context, used, used lightheartedly, obviously, uh, when we're talking about the Beatles coming to America, much less lightheartedly when we talk about the genocide of indigenous American peoples. But we are talking about ownership here of ideas, of art, of indeed stories for most of this proposition. So let's get to literature, which I know a lot better than music. I should get off of the stuff I'm weak on and onto the stuff I'm stronger on. Toni Morrison has said, everybody recognizes who has read Toni Morrison's amazing novel, Beloved, that it draws on the novels of William Faulkner, Mark Twain, and Edgar Allan Poe, all white, obviously, uh, white writers. Did Morrison appropriate those stories? Of course not. She's an American. They're her culture, too. In fact, it would be profoundly offensive, and I would say indeed racist, to suggest that a black person doesn't have equal right to, equal ownership of, the traditions of white authors in their cultures. Of course they do. It would be Jim Crow to suggest otherwise. It would be segregation to suggest otherwise. Black people should only read black authors. White people should only read white authors. White people should only write stories about white people. Is Toni Morrison part of my culture? Of course she is. Am I African American? No, I am not. If I try to write like Toni Morrison, <coughs> I will deserve the opprobrium that I would undoubtedly receive. First, because yes, it would be insensitive. Second, because I would almost certainly do it badly. It is not offensive or insensitive for Morrison to reclaim a cultural heritage that has been used to oppress people like her. The question is partly, in my view, about the asymmetry of power here. But when the, what the proposition says is cultural appropriation, it doesn't say that it's only a person in a position of power who can't appropriate the story from somebody in a structurally disempowered position. That would be a more nuanced statement. I would still have problems with it, but it would at least, we would be starting to get at some of the issues that in my view, we would need to address. Another problem with the proposition as stated is that it's a tautology. Cultural appropriation is, in my view, not a useful way for us to talk about this very important issue. And we're all agreed this is an important issue that we need to come to grips with as a society. But first, I would argue that the proposition is circular to begin with. Appropriation is inappropriate by definition. That's what it means. Appropriation means that you aren't supposed to take it. That's what makes it appropriation. So we're beginning with something that is circular. And we're actually using the same word to, def to argue against the other words. So I'm not, so, to me, it's not clear that we would be getting anywhere if we accepted this proposition, that we would actually be getting at the heart of the matter. But as I'm also trying to suggest, I don't believe that we can usefully demarcate or draw a cordon sanitaire around culture. If we could, I would argue that even if we could do that, we still couldn't police who belongs, according to the proposition, to a culture. And even if we could do that, I would further argue that even if we could, we can't establish who owns a cultural story, except in the very rare and very specific cases that James adduced. And I would argue even further that even if we could do all of those things, which I put it to you, we absolutely cannot do in almost every instance in which they arise, we still shouldn't, because border crossings can be good. 
And we can't so easily differentiate between appropriation and border crossing as the proposition would have us believe. Does cultural appropriation always cause harm? Not in the instance of Toni Morrison, for example. Not when people are punching up, for example. Free speech. The logic of free speech is to object to what someone says if it is objectionable, not to prohibit them from saying it a priori. Let them say it first, and then decide if they've said it well. Let them try to cross the border, and let them, and let them show you whether they are doing a good job. Some of you will know J.M. Kutzia's Booker Prize winning novel, Disgrace. And there is a key moment in which the, the protagonist who is male, he's an older man, and his daughter, he learns, has been raped. And in this pivotal moment, I'm sorry to spoil it for everybody, but in this pivotal <laughs> moment in the novel, he realizes, he has been told that he doesn't understand rape because he wasn't there. And he has an epiphany. She is mistaken in telling him this. Lucy's intuition is right after all. He does understand. He can, if he concentrates, if he loses himself, be there, be the men inhabiting them, fill them, sorry, be the men, inhabit them, fill them with the ghost of himself. The question is, does he have it in him to be the woman? I think this is an incredibly important question. The question is not, can he imagine being a rapist? The question is, can he imagine being somebody other than himself in that situation? Now, you might say that I'm muddying the waters because gender is not culture. But I would suggest to you that rape culture is a very real thing, and that a woman has a different experience of rape culture than a man has. And I think that this is exactly the kind of question that I want a man to be asking himself about rape culture. Does he have it in him to be the woman? I want more men to imagine what it's like to be the woman. I want more straight people to imagine what it's like to be queer. I want more white people to imagine what it's like to be a person of color. I want more Christians, secular or religious alike, to imagine being Muslim. I want more border crossing, not less. I want more imaginative bridges built, not fewer. To James's example of Emmett Till's mother, she wanted people to look at her son so that they could see what had been done to him. But what storytelling can do is to let us imagine what it would feel like to be him or to be her. And that is when we start to learn about social justice. There are also questions about theft. I think I'm going over time, so I will stop. We can come back to those perhaps uh, in questions. But I would put it to you that the slippery slope that the proposition puts us on is against all of our current conversation and all of our current, uh, um, in my view, right, um, thinking about what it means to be trans. We are thinking very hard about what it means to be trans in terms of sexual and gender identity, and it strikes me that in terms of cultural identity, we should also be thinking about what it would mean to be trans. It is not the time for putting up walls, it is the time for building imaginative bridges. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I didn't um, write anything, and I don't have any PowerPoint because I'm not really good at any of that. Um, I want to talk to you as a writer, someone who's at this cold face every day. I write plays, and I write novels, and I write dialogue, I write people. Um, and I'm in both camps, but as Melvin says, I'm the crossbencher, so I'm going to give both sides of this. And I agree with both. I'll give you an example of appropriation to me. And I'll never forget this. I think about 10 or 12 years ago, Giles Corrin, the food critic, whatever he is, um, wrote a column about, and I remember this specifically, because I tried to write about it and I was prevented. Okay. Um, 
He wrote about a restaurant in Brighton. I think it was a soul food restaurant or something. And he quoted his African-American friend called Spike about how he felt about the food. There ain't no way in the world that this person existed. It's not possible. I'll challenge him if he was here. That person did not exist. That was nobody's language who was African-American. I was outraged because I think it was in the Times and I was prevented from refuting it. I will never forget that. I'll give you another example of cultural appropriation. I'm African-American and I want to stress the American part because my people are the most powerful people of African descent or people of color in the world. We don't feel like that in the United States, but when we get outside, we find out we're Americans first. Ooh, I don't want to copy Trump. Um, about 20 years ago, I was teaching film in Accra, which is the only place I've ever been on the continent, and um, the, whole, the, the air conditioning went out and the air con, and of course, who was down the lobby complaining? All the African Americans. All of us who had come to see Amira, who were, you know, getting the big buses and the limos and everything to go see where our ancestors came from in our big cars. And we went down the lobby. We were the only ones down the lobby. And yelling and screaming, where's the air con? What's happening? What? And of course, the Ghanaians were very calm and they said, well, you know, it was a storm the power's out. And I looked around at my fellow Americans, like we were dressed African, right, whatever that is. And we had the equivalent of, I didn't do it, but the, we had the equivalent of what you might have a Slovakian skirt, uh, you know, some, a, a, a Bruges scarf, something from Wales, you know, the, the European equivalent. What's European clothes? You know, what, what is that? So we came as Africans. It was a horrible sight. And I'm sure the Ghanaians were like, you know, they, we were tourists, it, it was dreadful. Those two things to me are cultural appropriation. And so therefore cultural appropriation isn't not only about color, it's about power. It's about who can take something and use it and change it and make it themselves. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, Wole Soyenka, I write plays, and Wole Soyenka came to Chicago and to do Death of the King's Horseman, his great play about Nigeria. He had to work with African-American actors. And of course, they had to do Nigerians. How did they know what that was or how to do it? They didn't, nobody did, nobody cared to know. They took accents from the movies. At one point during rehearsal, I heard from a friend of mine, uh, Mrs. Soyenka said to this crew, my name is Wole, not Wally, it's Wole. And this whole production was all of them trying to be what they thought Nigerians were. Nobody said anything. That to me was cultural appropriation. I don't even know if there was a researcher there. I think there were Nigerian actors there who could have done it, who should have done it. Uh, I have written a novel that has a black British woman in it, but I made her a university graduate because I couldn't and wouldn't write her as anything else. Because for me, black British language is extremely complex and I would never attempt it. For me to do it, would be cultural appropriation. Um, because I would be trying to make a sound that I, as a writer, know how complicated and complex that sound is. I can't do it. And I think we're still in an age, we're still sort of young in terms of that, where we have to be careful about voice. And so I, I'm with James on that. I think I have to be very careful, very careful. But this is one with Sarah. Okay, so I have a story that I want to write about a black British woman. But I'm not gonna write that story because I'm not black British. That's my political self. Even though 
I have a story to tell. Politically, I won't write that story. Now, suppose there is a woman, black British woman, born and bred in Camden, who wants to tell a story about her grandmother, who grew up in Kingston, in Jamaica. But she's not gonna write that story because she's never been in Jamaica. And they didn't, she can't hear it. She can't hear that story, she's never been there. So we go to Kingston and there's a woman there who wants to write a story about a woman in the Kalahari Desert, a song woman. But she's not gonna write that story. She's never been in the Kalahari. She doesn't know anything about it. She can only read about it. Politically, I agree with that. I have no problems because there's some great writers in all of these, these areas who can do that. What I worry about as a writer is I may miss genius. There might be genius in that mix somewhere. There might be somebody in there who could tell us something and they didn't come from that place but they got something to say. We're gonna miss them if we get too tight in this thing called cultural appropriation, we're gonna miss them. And we're in danger of doing that right now. The great debate between Wole, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the great uh, Jinua Achebe over <laughs> Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness. And I remember when I read that uh, debate and I was arguing in my head because I wouldn't do it in person with, with uh, the master, Ajebe. And I wanted to say to him, Heart of Darkness isn't about Africa. It's got nothing to do with Africa. It's about Europe. It's about London. That's the heart of darkness. You got that wrong. You got that wrong. But Ajebe was brilliant enough to say, and clear enough to say, I want my work next to Conrad's. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about him not having the right. I want you to put my work in the canon too. That's the other part of it, is the canon. Who decides it? Who describes it? Who defines it? Maybe that's what we need to be talking about too, is the canon. And maybe the canon is shifting, which I hope it is. Um, so I would say that for me as a writer, I know when I'm culturally appropriating and I won't do that. I will not write a voice because I can't do that. But I can write a feeling. I can write a state of being. I'm writing Charles Darwin now. I'm writing uh, Rambo now. I would hate to think that I could not enter Charles Darwin's head and his mind. I could not enter Rambo that I didn't have the humanity, I didn't have the capacity, I didn't have the agency to do it. And if we deny that agency, as Sarah says, we restrict our own humanity and the expansion of, of, uh, of the culture. And the last thing I wanna say, which is ironic about um, Jinua Ajebe, and Joseph Conrad. They were masters of the English language and it was not their mother tongue. They crossed because that was where they could say what they had to say. And Achebe was brought up, or he was pulled up on that by people saying, why are you writing in English? That's a colonial language. That's the colonial language, write in the language of your people, write in the language of the people. And Achebe said, I want to write in the language in which we can all communicate because it's about that. And that language at the time was the colonial language of English and he chose it. So I'm more in Sarah's camp on our humanity and expansion of it in our agency is the most important thing, and our human capacity is the most important thing, and we are in danger of missing genius out there if we restrict people too much. Thank you. And now the vote leaves into sight. I just reminded the motion in 2007, Neil, cultural appropriation is an inappropriate method for writers.
Those in favour, those in favour of James Young's proposition, would they please raise their hands? Right. Those against, those who uh, went with Sarah's arguments, would please raise their hands. Well, uh, is an inappropriate? Well, you won. <laughs> Thanks to the uh, Royal Institute of Philosophy for laying all this on. Thank you. Thank you.